muted. You can hear me. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to get uh, get started now. Um, so thanks for joining today's session. Um, quick introduction for those who don't know me. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm the integration manager at AIT. I've been working with Card Exchange for well over five years now. Um, and the purpose of this webinar is to try and share some of the more advanced functionality uh, that it can offer. Uh, today's webinar is designed to give some details and demonstration of the more advanced features of Card Exchange and to highlight some of the things that it can do uh, to enhance the use of cards in your organization. So first and foremost, I hope that uh, everyone can hear me. Um, if you can't, um, but you can see my screen hopefully, uh, please notify me by the question function in the uh, in the. Uh, due to the large number of people attending today's webinar, and for the comfort of everyone, uh, I'll be running the session in listen-only mode in order to minim minimise any background noise. But if you do have any questions, please note them down as they come up and submit them via the questions function on the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll answer uh, at the end of each section. Um, questions will be treated anonymously, or alternatively, we can take individ individual in-depth discussions uh, that may be required offline. Uh, we'll also make available a recorded version of today's webinar so you can revisit any of the information in future. So we have a mixed audience today from various different sectors, uh, so I'm going to try and keep the webinar fairly generic, but I'm going to assume that you already have some exposure to Card Exchange so that I can demonstrate the more advanced features of the software. There's a few snippets of code uh, in the slide ahead which are to be used as a reference. Um, if you don't understand them, then please don't panic. I'll be explaining what they do and if you'd like further details or assistance with implementing any of the things I'm going to cover, you can get in touch with us after the webinar. So the key areas that I'll be talking about today are uh, the mappings, which is uh, something that gets uh, a term that gets thrown about quite a lot in card exchange. So I'll just be touching on what they are and how they work. Uh, we're going to be looking at the management of data, uh, the best way to use the information you've got and capturing information. I'm uh, going to have a look at some custom designer functions. Uh, so this shows some of the ways that you can make the card design more dynamic and responsive uh, based on the data that, uh, that you're using. Uh, we're also going to have a quick look at contactless encoding, uh, briefly looking at the card technologies, some of the, the new and existing ones, um, the ones that we work with most commonly anyway, and how card exchange works when it comes to cards. We'll uh, finish up with any questions you may have, um, and I'll do my very best to answer them. Or if there's any configuration that you'd like me to try and demonstrate, I'll be more than happy to do so. Um, so again, just to kind of make a note of any questions that you might have, uh, or use the questions panel and go to webinar, and we'll uh, we'll get get onto those uh, towards the end. Uh, so let's uh, kick things off and have a look at the mappings first. So in in a nutshell, uh, a mapping is a link a card exchange to handle a piece of variable information. So uh, that might be a, a, a bit of data from a database. Um, it might be a piece of text on a card or something like that. So there are four categories that card exchange breaks these down into. So we have visible, storage, magnetic, and contactless mappings. Um, each category provides the facility to read or write information to a specific element of the card. So that might be in the physical printing. Uh, or it might be something behind the scenes, such as a piece of data that's written to a database, or something that's maybe stored uh, on the card or read from the card. So each mapping item can be linked to a different source of data. Uh, I've listed the most common uh, examples on the slide, but there are a couple of others, such as uh, biometric fingerprint capture um, or uh, a, a signature being captured to a, a digital pad. Um, we don't do a great deal of work with those, but they are options that are available. But the common ones that we work with are shown on the screen. It's really just telling Card Exchange what to do with these pieces of information. So you might have a mapping to a visible piece of text on the card, and that's generated from one of these uh, these elements. Um, the mappings are used uh, a lot for lots of different things. Uh, they're the things that tie the card and the data together. Um, it can get quite complicated for more advanced setup where there's a lot of information um, being written to a database or being pushed onto a card. Um, but uh, if you think about all the various elements, uh, a lot of them on the card will be fixed. Um, so you might have a logo or a, a company name. 
Um, and then you might have some variable elements like a photo or, or the, the user's name um, and, and things things like that are normally linked to mappings. So one of the types of mapping is, is a .NET function. Um, this is a, a piece of code that can be executed to perform a routine um, and optionally return some data for card exchange to deal with. Uh, I've listed a couple of examples on the slide there for projects that I've worked on previously where I've had to write some code um, to produce data outside of card exchange. I'm not going to go into the details about .NET today, or we'll be here for weeks, um, but it's a comprehensive programming language that's widely used for a lot of Windows applications. Um, so the, the fact that card exchange can, uh, can pull um, information from a, a .NET routine means that you can do more advanced things outside of the software. Um, there are just a couple of examples shown there uh, on, the, on the screen. One of the other mappings that we uh, we use quite a lot and might, might not be um, understood uh, particularly well is manual data entry. Um, now, this pretty much does what it says on the tin. It requires the operator to input details prior to the printing of the card. Um, these manual data entries, they can be uh, fixed values. Uh, it can be a prompt that can uh, then flash up. Um, and what I'll do now is I'm just going to jump in and just do a very quick uh, quick example card, um, which doesn't use a database connection, but instead allows the operator to key in uh, a name and uh, maybe an employer for, for a visitor card. Um, we do uh, supply cards, um, uh, sorry, card printers um, that can erase cards and then reprint them so they can be reused uh, in future. Um, and uh, this is quite a useful thing if you want to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to jump into the card designer and I'll pull that across onto my screen for you to see. And what I'm going to do is just very, very quickly put a text box on my card here. And we'll just put name in there. I'm going to copy that and paste it. And this text box, oops, just bring it over onto this screen. This text box is going to say company. Um, now what we've got here is in the properties window, um, we have a fixed value for the text. So uh, it will just show whatever I type in that box. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to change that to uh, a script. Now what this enables me to do is instead of that being a fixed piece of information, um, it's actually going to be a kind of calculated uh, or variable bit of data. So when I switch that over to scripts, um, it's then going to ask me, well, what, what scripts, what, what's, what's this variable going to be? So I'm going to call that company text. And it then prompts and it says, well, what value do you want me to, to give to company text? So I'm just going to put company for now. So it should look exactly the same. Then on the name field here, I'm just going to do exactly the same again. I'm going to change that to name text. And again, it's going to ask me what I want in there. So I'll put for name, surname. OK, so what we've done here is we've created a card with two bits of text. Um, but instead of them being fixed values, we've linked them to this, this script object. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more about scripts and how they work uh, later on, so don't, don't worry too much. But this is just uh, a, a quick example of how we can, we can quickly change the information on the card on, on the fly. So if I save my card design, let me jump back here. We can see we've now got our four names, surname and company. Uh, what I'm then going to do is just jump into the mappings window up here. And oh, we've got a, a, another object here, which I've uh, left behind from a previous demo. But here's our two bits of uh, bits of data here, the company text and name text. And you can see they've got no mapping, so, so the software doesn't know what to do with them. There's no, no data there. And then from my list here, I'm just going to choose enter manually. Uh, I can set a predefined value if I want to. I'm going to leave that blank. And I'm going to tick the box here that says make this value editable in the manual entry window. I've then got some other options, so prompt for value before printing, value cannot be null or empty, and show previous value. So I'm going to make it so that it can be left blank. I'll make it so it also shows the previous value, which is useful if you're printing a couple of cards for a couple of people from the same place. I'm then going to do exactly the same with my name text. So again, enter manually, prompt for value before printing, and show previous value. So if I click finish now, 
those objects now where I gave them a my full name, surname, company, they've now gone blank because obviously we didn't put any data in the mapping. But if I then go to print a card, it's going to ask me what, what information I want to put in there. So I would put in my name and the company that I work for um, and then click OK and it would print the card. So that's a very, very quick way of being able to dynamically change the information on the card where you don't have a database um, link any, any information through. So that's a very, very quick overview of mappings in card exchange. They're, they're not really too scary once you understand what they do, and hopefully that quick example has shown how visible mapping items work in a, in a card design. So next, I'm going to look at managing data within card exchange. Um, and again, I'll try to keep this quite high level, but if you have any queries, then please send me a question via the control panel. I'll get back to you at the end of the presentation. So when we're working with a database, we'll often be provided with what's called a view. Um, this is a really useful way of drawing information from lots of different tables or even different databases and presenting it as a single entity that we can then use for printing cards. Uh, for example, you might have a table on a, an HR system that holds personal details of a user, such as their name. Um, but then there's maybe a different table, it could even be in another another database, uh, that has information relating to their enrollment or employment details. So you can use a view to join this information together and just present it all in one table. Uh, this works well in most cases, uh, however, if we're wanting to write information back somewhere, then we'd have to give consideration to where this is going to go. Um, because a view is often virtual um, and comprised of data from lots of different sources, it's not always possible to write back to it. So often we'll read from a view, that will give us our list of uh, card holders, um, but then we'll write back to another separate table. Uh, drop down menus can also speed up data entry for operators. Uh, there may be a situation where a choice needs to be made for some information on a card which can only be done manually. Um, by presenting a drop down menu instead of a text box, uh, we can reduce the entry time and uh, keying errors can be prevented. Um, so instead of asking them to type in some details, uh, for example, it might be, um, uh, say for example, on our visitor card that we had there, we might have a drop down to choose a category. So they might be a visitor, a contractor, a, a cleaner, a caterer, something like that. Um, one of the other things uh, that we also then look at is uh, a print counter, uh, which is useful for keeping track of how many cards each user has had printed. Uh, writing to multiple databases is one of the strengths also of card exchange and it can be used to simultaneously update different systems which may also have different database technologies. And finally something I've already just quickly uh, covered in the uh, in the quick demonstration uh, is working without a database which is often useful for producing cards quickly for guests or for new staff that might not be enrolled onto, uh, onto a database yet. Um, so I'm just going to quickly look at a couple of these things in a bit more detail. So uh, drop-down menus can be configured in a couple of different ways. Uh, they need to link to a specific column in a table of data. So uh, unfortunately, they can't be used without a database of some kind. But even if you're creating manual cards like we did previously, it's useful to store the details at the time of print for future use. So what we could do is we could do it slightly differently. We could have a database that we just we just keep adding to uh, every time that we print a card, and it just helps keep track of how many cards we've issued into who. We can either create a drop drop down box uh, by querying a table, so the table would typically just have two columns. One would show the list for the drop down box, so you might just have a, a visitor, a contractor, caterer. Um, the, the other column would actually give the value that will be displayed or stored in the database after selection. Um, so one example of uh, a case that we did uh, previously was um, the operator needed to be able to uh, select the text that was printed on the back of the card. Um, this wasn't something that we could do automatically from their database. So what we did is we gave them a drop-down box with four or five options, and it chose different um, uh, uh, different health and safety notices or something like that for the, for the back of the card um, and they could then store that and then print that and they didn't have to type that information in.
which is not to be confused with something that uh, Card Exchange calls a global counter. So the print counter increments accounts for each individual, and it's stored in the database, which reflects how many times they have had a card printed. A global counter is stored within the card design itself, and it just counts up every time a card's printed. So it's useful for numbering cards or for keeping track of a total number of prints, but it shouldn't be used for tracking issue numbers for each user. The global counter is, is uh, for a unique ID for each card, whereas the print counter is just, just to, to increment how many cards each person has had printed. Um, the print counter set up as a storage item the update happens automatically and the storage item doesn't appear in the mappings list um, because it's already mapped so uh, where we had our, our mappings that I demonstrated earlier we had them as visible items if we created other storage items to store uh, you know the card number for example in a database uh, we'd have to choose that that mapping uh, linked to the card serial number but with a print counter we don't do that it happens automatically behind the scenes so as we touched on earlier, it's possible for card exchange uh, to work without a data tool. Uh, there's a few ways to alter the information shown on the card, but the best way is the use of the manual data entry that I demonstrated earlier. Though it's not the only way, it's certainly the simplest. So you could configure the database to add new records, um, so it, we could work with a small database that wasn't pre-populated, but we could add to it as we go along. Um, it's not quite as intuitive, it doesn't give you a pop-up box that says please enter the information, but it does allow you to store that information for future reprinting. Um, the other way that's, uh, that, that I see a lot of people do is they actually alter the card design each time. So they'll launch the designer, um, they'll go in, they'll make changes, they'll then save that, drop back to the main card exchange window and then uh, print, um, print the cards um, that way. So I'm now going to step things up a gear. I'm going to look at how we can alter the card design programmatically with Card Exchange. Um, this enables the card design to be changed automatically at the time of print. Um, so Python is another programming language, much like .NET. Uh, and although I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of it, I will provide some examples that can be that you can use uh, or you can adjust uh, in future. It's a very popular language with the Raspberry Pi platform. You might have heard of this uh, as a way uh, of engaging students in, uh, in schools in, in programming and, uh, and, and kind of some more fundamental IT skills. Um, I've highlighted a few simple things that can be done with the use of custom functions, and I'm going to show you how they work. Um, apologies if I do lose you at any point in this, but obviously if there's something that, that does you know, uh, look interesting to you, but you're not sure how to implement it, please get in touch and we can, uh, we can give you a hand with that. So just a few things to note first. Um, Python is very fussy about the indentations. Uh, it's crucial that each line matches up. Uh, and usually if it follows a loop or a statement which ends with a colon, it'll need indenting uh, an extra tab or space on the line after. If you make a mistake, the error will be shown in the content box uh, for any of the text objects that link to a custom script on the, on the line to help you troubleshoot the issue. To use a custom function, you simply create a text object as you would for any other text and set the data type to be a script like we did earlier. You type the function name in, followed by a pair of brackets uh, to call it. If the function requires some external input, like a, a date or, or a name or some piece of text, you'll need to put some variable names within the brackets separated by column, uh, commas if necessary. So previously where we created that script item, I just gave it a name, just a, just a, a word, um, and then it, it said, okay, that's great, what, what do you want to do with that? Um, in the example on the screen there, you can see I've got a, a function called my function, um, and I've put the two brackets after it. And the two brackets tell it that this is not, not just a variable, not, not just a, a, a name for a mapping. It's actually a function that's going to do something for us. Um, so on the screen, just a very simple example there. Uh, the function's called my function, and it just returns the word hello. That's all that it does. So I've created a text object, mapped it to the script called my function, denoted by the brackets, and the text returned by it was displayed. So the last example was pretty useless, really. I mean, you'd never write a function that just returned fixed text. Uh, it's easier just to add the text directly to the design. Um, in this example that I'm just showing here, uh, we do something a bit more useful. What we're doing is we're stripping all but the first character of a word and displaying that. So this is really handy where a database might contain the full name of an individual, but you want to display uh, just the initial on the card. Um, so 
what we've got here is my function is called first char, um, and I pass it a piece of text, which is the, the name. And then what it does is it just returns the very first character um, of, of the name there. So this is really useful in schools where um, staff don't want their first names uh, in full, but they might just want an initial and their surname. So uh, we, we can we can work out what that initial is from, from the full name uh, in the designer. Um, so obviously create, creating this dynamic text is easy. You saw me do it uh, earlier with the uh, with the manual data. Just create a text field, set it to be a script. You give it the script name, and if you put brackets after it, even if you don't put anything in those brackets, that then shows that it's a function, a, a variable, a, a, which we're going to use for a mapping. Um, again, this might seem a bit complicated. We, we, we are always here on hand to help if you'd like some assistance in getting this set up. Uh, this is obviously a, a bit more of a technical webinar today, so uh, but, but obviously if there's anything that looks interesting, then, uh, then do, do get in touch with us. So this time, I'm going to get a little bit more complicated with what we can do. Um, and we want here to highlight if an individual is under 18 uh, on a card. So what this function does is it receives the date of birth from the user from a database column. Um, it then does some maths comparing it to the current date. So what we have here is uh, we're passing it the date of birth. And the date of birth is then um, uh, quickly uh, sort of analyzed. Um, so it, it works out, you know, it, it is a valid uh, a valid date. Um, it then generates today's date. Um, so we have a system uh, date time today. And it then works out the age of the user. So it takes today's year minus the date of birth year. And then it will look and say, well, OK, that's less than 18. So it returns the text U18, um, which is then printed on the card. Otherwise, uh, if they're over 18, Nothing's returned. It just just returns uh, uh, none, nothing. Um, so you can see also there's some libraries that get imported at the top of the code. Um, this is often necessary with Python. Uh, so that it knows what functionality is required. So we're importing the date time function here, time, and system, which is actually a, a .NET library uh, that Python can call on. So I'll just give you a very very quick demo of how that works. Uh, so I've got a card here. If I jump into the designer quickly. Windows over onto the right screen. So what we've got here is this, this U18 text is actually a script is under 18. And up here on the functions tab, we've got our little routine that I just showed you on the screen there. And then if I just jump through the data here, you can see for me, I'm, I'm definitely over over 18. So it just changes to this placeholder here called text three. But if I change to Joe Blogs, his date of birth uh, shows that he's he's under 18, so it changes that text to 18. And then in the main window, we just toggle between them. You can see here, it shows you 18 for Joe, but nothing for me, unfortunately. Um, uh, also, one of the other things I'll touch on later, um, you can see the student's ID actually changed color at the top of the uh, top of the design there. Um, so again, this is something where we can uh, we can dynamically change elements of the card. But I'll go into doing some format changing in a, in a, in a short while. Uh, sticking with dates, this function here is going to calculate an expiry date for a card two years into the future, and it's going to print it on the card. So this is constantly updated so that the cards are always valid for exactly two years from the time of print. Uh, I've used a concatenation field here uh, to put the word expires before the date. Uh, this is just a way of merging two pieces of information together, uh, in this case some fixed text that says expires, followed by the calculated date. So again, I think I have a very quick example I can show you. Uh, or not, because I've removed that. But if I jump into the card designer, just bring it back onto this screen for you. And what I'll do is I'll put some text down here. Just expires in. And then what I'll do is I'll just change that to a concatenation. So it will remember the bit of text that I put in first. But then our second element um, is going to be the script is under 18 DOB. 
Now it's always going to be explorer data <laughs> because I'm getting a bit mixed up with what function I'm doing. And what it's saying here is it's saying name explorer date is not defined, and that's because I haven't written the function yet. There is no function in here uh, which is which is called um, expiry date. So once we created that, it would then populate the information on the card there. Okay. Uh, this is a quite a, quite a weird function here that I had to write for a customer whose database always stored everyone's names as surname, comma first name. Um, so we, we didn't want that printed on the card that way. Um, what it does, it just splits the name in half on, on the comma. Um, it then reorders the words, and it strips off any spaces. So it took a little bit of figuring out, but it seems to work quite well. Um, and I think, hopefully, as long as I haven't messed this one up. I know that was the one that I did. Um, I did change. But uh, if, if I had a, a piece of information and, and say my name was just in one field as field and comma mark, what it could then do is it could then swap those bits around and then display it in the, in the correct format. Um, if that's something that you do want to have a look at, then by all means uh, let me know and I can, uh, I can get that set up um, to, to do a, a quick demo offline as well. Um, the last thing I'm going to look at uh, is the way that we can use functions uh, to alter the appearance of a card rather than the content. So the example that I showed you uh, earlier with the uh, with this, the under 18 flag on the student ID, um, what I've done is I've modified the, the bit of code that uh, works out if a user is under 18. And instead of returning that text to print on the card, it's going to return a color code. So I'll highlight the text in red, um, just down here. So we have these FFs for the red value. Um, and it will uh, return it as black if, if the user is over 18. So this is just an HTML color code um, like you would use for uh, changing the colors on a, on a web page or anything like that. Um, but it is a 32-bit value, which is uh, important to note, um, because it has a transparency value at the front. So if you just want a solid color, you just put FF, and then you would just find the value to red, green, and blue, uh, like that one. Um, these are all set up in the expressions tab. Um, so instead of uh, the, the, uh, the, the actual content of the text being linked to a script, what we do is we then go into expressions and we can change one of the uh, one of the parameters. So here I've changed the foreground color and I've told it to link to a function called rating color. And again, pass it to the data first so it can then work out whether it needs to, uh, to give a red or a black color to the text. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look at uh, contactless encoding. Um, most of our customers that are working with cards, they do some kind of encoding uh, with the card. Um, some still use MagStripe, which is absolutely fine. Um, that's quite a basic kind of write-only um, onto the card. So what we would do is we uh, encode a student number or something like that into the MagStripe with or without any student number as well. Um, so that when the, when the card is in flight on a reader, it will just return that number. Uh, contactless cards. Um, uh, work a little bit like the, the kind of um, uh, contactless payments. Um, you just tap the card, um, it will then talk with it wirelessly um, and uh, return a number uh, or a piece of information from the card. So, my fair classic cards um, uh, is a card technology that's a very open platform. Uh, it's in use in a lot of places and is, is a very cost effective uh, card technology. Uh, there's a couple of different flavors, so 1K and 4K uh, being the most common, um, and it simply refers to the amount of memory inside the card for storing data. So memory is split up into sectors and blocks, uh, the amount of which depends on the size of card you opt for. 1K and 4K are the most common. 1K cards are now becoming a bit more difficult to source, and 4K is a, is a drop-in replacement for these, um, which shouldn't require any changes to card reading hardware if you're only using the, the first 1K of, uh, of storage in the card. Um, if, we're, if we're not actually doing it in writing, card, we're just reading that unique uh, identifier back, um, then the, the 1K and 4K cards are completely um, cross-compatible. The next step up from Classic really is, uh, is, is DES5. Uh, EV1 is the technology we come across uh, the, the most. 
Uh, this car technology is a bit more intelligent than classic, uh, and it manages the internal memory much more effectively. Uh, it also offers far superior protection of the data with uh, communication between the card and reader being encrypted. And it's the technology that's used for the Oyster card around London, uh, and it's becoming more popular as an upgrade from more classic cards in other sectors as well. In addition to various memory sizes available for cards, uh, just to add to confusion, there's also a choice of four bytes or seven byte unique IDs. Um, so originally, four bytes of data was uh, was used for the unique ID, and that permitted around four billion card numbers, um, which is a lot. But eventually, worldwide, uh, they started to run out of numbers, and in some cases, the card manufacturers just started over again. So the numbers can't be guaranteed to be unique worldwide. Um, Remember that this technology isn't just used in smart cards, so although 4 billion sounds like an awful lot, um, uh, MyFed technology is also used in things like parcel tracking and asset management, uh, so the numbers can very quickly add up. Um, to overcome this, uh, this limitation on numbers, uh, a 7 byte unique ID was, uh, was created. Card exchange is completely compatible with both 4 and 7 byte numbers. Um, the 7 byte ID allowed something ridiculous, and I think it's, it's 72 quadrillion combinations. I, I, I don't even know if that's a real number, but uh, written down, it's an awful lot of digits. So, uh, so hopefully that should, uh, should see us through for, for a little while longer. So to talk to the cards, uh, Card Exchange usually does this on Windows Smart Card service so that you can communicate with the card reader. Um, this being the case, the printer must be connected to a PC via a USB cable. Most printers do have a network port, but this can only be used for printing. The encoding of cards is not possible through this. Where the printer does need to be removed from the PC or shared with multiple computers, there is a component called the print server, which can handle uh, one or more printers through uh, a PC, which is designated to be sort of a host server. Um, with other, with other instances of card exchange, you can communicate with this. Uh, this negates the need for the printer to be connected via a USB cable to the operator's PC, um, and it allows uh, sharing of the uh, printer as well if, if you've got more than one copy of card exchange. Uh, finally, the main purpose of contactless encoding is to prepare the card for use once printed. Um, often this is simply a matter of just capturing the card's unique ID or serial number. Uh, but sometimes the card will be prepared for use with a third-party system like a catering solution or a door access system. Uh, even if at the time of print the card is not going to be used for anything other than a visible ID, it is worth capturing the card details, just that unique ID, so that the future use of the card doesn't require uh, recalling cards or getting users to associate their cards with them again. So, that's enough talking from me. Um, I want to hand over to you um, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, a couple of queries were raised during the slides, so I'll, uh, I'll just uh, answer them. Uh, so first up, uh, do all the features you've talked about require special licenses? Um, no, not, uh, not a special license, but I'm assuming you've got the ultimate edition of Card Exchange. Uh, this is what we most often supply, as it's the only version that will support contactless encoding. Uh, of the cards. Uh, next question, what's the latest card exchange version and is it possible to upgrade from an older one? Um, it really depends on how old your version is and whether you've got an SBS license which is used for more than one PC. Um, it might be best to drop us an email with your details so we can see if they've got any uh, costs involved in upgrading for you. Um, uh, the latest version is 9.3. Um, if you've got uh, version 8 or version 9, so if you've got uh, an 8 point something or a 9 point something released as a standalone license, uh, then I know that you can uh, usually upgrade that for free. Um, if you give us a, a call uh, or an email, we can get in touch and we can go through the process with you and make sure that everything works uh, as it should. A uh, question that's just come in, is there any documentation for the things covered today? Uh, yes, there is a, a manual available online uh, which you can get to from the Service Centre in Card Exchange. So you just click on Service Centre and then you go to Help. Uh, that will bring up your web browser. And it's, all, it's all done online. You can search through it that way. Um, it is quite comprehensive. doesn't quite go into as much detail and give as many examples as I've done today, but it is it's a pretty useful uh, resource um, there. Uh, another question. Uh, other slides available to download? Uh, yep, we'll be uploading the webinar shortly. Um, so you can review it at a later date. Uh, or if you're struggling to get to sleep one night, you can uh, listen to me waffling on for the half an hour or so, and um, hopefully that'll, uh, that'll send you off. 
So that's uh, all from me. I do hope you found it useful. Um, and if you have any other queries once we're finished, uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, the details should be on the screen now. Um, so thanks for listening. I'll let you get on with the rest of your day and, uh, and get uh, a step close to the weekend. Um, and uh, if you have any queries, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you very much.